And we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm very excited to have Dominic Williams from Dfinity here with me today. We're going to be talking about the decentralized internet and specifically the internet computer. Dominic, how are you getting on today? Are you well? I'm well. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Very, 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 very glad to hear that. It's an absolute pleasure. Before we get started, guys, this is a live session. We're on LinkedIn Live. So please do give us your GMs. Let us know where you're coming from in the world where, which city you're representing, which country you're representing. And don't forget, there will be Q&A at the end of the session. So as we go through this, if there's any questions you have for Dominic or myself, please do put them into the comment section. Please do add them in. I'm going to try and multitask as best I can through the show to pick up the key questions and anything that you want to know about Dominic, about his story, about Definity, about internet computer, about Web3, about the direction of travel, please ask your questions and we'll get to those in the kind of final 15 minutes of the show. But let's get started. Dominic, for those who haven't met you, for those who have, haven't followed your backstory, could you give us the brief introduction to your experience and your journey in Web3? Well, you know, I'm, a, I'm, what, I'm what you call an engineering entrepreneur. Um, I'm a very technical person that likes building um, different kinds of you know technologies and services and so on. And um, before I got into crypto, um, which was a long time ago before the word Web3 was uh, being used. I created a, a, a massively multiplayer online computer game. Um, very cool thing, actually. I spent a lot of time on the uh, back end of it. It supported millions of users. And you know, I'd raised venture capital in, in, in America, so I'd relocated from um, London to Palo Alto in Silicon Valley. And 2013, um, you know, Bitcoin had been on my radar, never had the time. Um, back in April, it did one of its kind of parabolic jumps and uh, everyone started looking at it going, wow. I started trading Bitcoin and um, got sucked, sucked into crypto. By the end of the year, I was working full time in crypto. Um, I, I had had, you know, uh, some, some sort of antecedents to that, like I, sort of 1998, 1999, I, you know, I've been playing around with this. Uh, library called Crypto Plus Plus by a guy called Wei Dai. Um, the, the, the web page for that cryptography library uh, had a link to a thing called B Money, which uh, you know was one of the, I think probably one of the inputs to Bitcoin. I think it was referenced by the Satoshi's white paper. And I mean, I'll be honest, I, I you know I, I read it at the time. Um, gosh, almost like twenty five years ago, twenty five years ago now. Um, I, I couldn't make head or tail of it. I could see that it was something very interesting, but I didn't understand it. So I did, but I did have those kind of like, you know, the, the memory of it was somehow in my brain and, and I'd been playing around with uh, applied cryptography and distributed systems, you know, uh, for a long time. And so, um, you know, I, 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 when I read Satoshi's paper, of course, I was completely enthralled, like many people were, and decided uh, to, get, to get involved with crypto full time. To begin with, just, you know, I was just trading crypto. By the end of the year, by the end of 2013, uh, I decided I wanted to create something called GameCoin, um, which would be like a virtual currency for the games industry and would allow people to, you know, sell virtual goods and then move value to another game and buy other virtual goods and create some kind of like, you know, virtual goods economy. And I quickly realized that, you know, big Bitcoin couldn't, you know, wasn't a suitable platform because um, the trend, you know, the, the transaction rate is pretty low and the trend transactions are expensive and so proof of stake cryptocurrencies there's one called nxt and uh, i thought well maybe i could repurpose that to create game coin started digging into it and uh realized that you know it's pretty technically flawed it was some really interesting um obvious mistakes that are being made tried talking to people developing it and eventually you know, after a few months realized that wait a second <laughs> this isn't something i can you know repurpose and not only that you know that the industry is pretty nascent like the, the state of the you know the state of the art isn't that sophisticated uh, maybe i could contribute so i ended up pretty much working kind of full time in 2014 um uh, working on sort of you know specialized mathematics and uh distributed computer, computing techniques um, on on ways to um create a much faster more scalable cryptocurrency so i think i was the first person in the world to uh work on repurposing something called uh, uh, you know, traditional Byzantine fault tolerant consensus math for the blockchain setting. Um, everyone tries to use this stuff like 
today, but you know, I was the first person in 2014 to be doing that. And I think I was also the first person to sort of propose sharded blockchains and things like that. So uh, I produced a, a paper in, in, in October 2014 describing a cryptocurrency called Pebble. It was only distributed at the time to insiders, like you know, people like Vitalik, Juan Bennett got a copy. Nick Sol, a bunch of people got copies of this thing. Um, and I started soliciting feedback. I didn't go ahead with it for a bunch of reasons, but uh, you can see the paper actually, if you hunt around on the internet computer wiki, you can find um, this, this paper, it's kind of interesting. Um, but at that time, I was very involved with the early Ethereum community. And of course the big advance there was that, um, you know, blockchain wasn't, you know, a blockchain, we, we're beginning to see that a blockchain could do more than just host tokens. Right, so you know, Pebble really was, uh, it was a, it was a, more like a traditional cryptocurrency, albeit with some special features. The idea was like, you could set up recurring payments to get rid of social, to get rid of advertising on social media. So the idea was, you know, people could set up recurring Pebble payments to Facebook to get rid of advertising in the Facebook experience, right? That kind of thing, which obviously requires the ability to process, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of transactions a second. Um, but you know, Ethereum had sort of uh, made this advance, you know, and we were really seeing that you could, you know, host tamper-proof, unstoppable software on a blockchain, which, which at the time were called smart contracts. I mean, it's really just blockchain code, right? And uh, you know, it's becoming apparent to me personally that that, that this blockchain code, smart contracts, um, was a completely new kind of software, and it was totally revolutionary. And so I was sort of like beginning to pivot my interest just from, you know, cryptocurrency, you know, albeit with some features like for recurring payments and things like that, to, to, towards uh, block, you know, general purpose blockchains that could host smart contract code. And somebody in this early community, and, um, you know, it's pretty small back then. And it was like, a, there, was an, there was an early Ethereum community that like traveled the world, like a traveling circus, you know, to, doing all these different events. And, you know, it wasn't really, we weren't driven by money, but, you know, um, love for the technology and um, interest in the potential positive social impact and so on. Um, it was a really you know, magical time in many ways. Um, and then somebody in that community uh, came up with this word world computer, world computer, right? And I, I guess, you know, it meant different things to different people. But for me, I think, you know, I've been coding for so long now. I mean, decades and decades, I've built every kind of different system under the sun. And I've always been looking for the next thing, like there must be a better way of building systems and services and so on. And, you know, I'd come from, uh, in fact, my last kind of venture, I'd built this computer game that had millions of users. So for me, when I heard world computer, I'm, I'm thinking about a, a world computer blockchain that supports billions of users and really. So I'm like, wow, like world computer, wait a second. Um, this blockchain code, these smart contracts is a completely new kind of software. It's revolutionary. Look, it's tamper-proof. You don't need to protect it with a firewall. Can you imagine? And you, you could build systems that don't need a firewall. Um, imagine if you could build a, a, a large enterprise system or a social network. I mean, you wouldn't need a firewall to protect it. You wouldn't need a security team. This is incredible. It's unstoppable. It simplifies software development because code and state is kind of combined. And, you know, the world actually spent $5 trillion in IT last year. Five trillion dollars in total. Um, of that, only half a trillion dollars was spent on cloud, actually, right? So like ten percent, um, and then one hundred and seventy-nine million on, you know, cybersecurity, like you know, firewalls and seam logging. And, and now of that five trillion, a large part of it is actually just, you know, operational cost. Like eighty eighty-five percent is the cost of people managing all this complex technology, right? So if you can simplify the way. You know, if you can simplify how we build things like systems and services, whether that's a CRM system or a social network, um, you can really massively reduce the cost invo involved in, in, in IT. And that can be reinvested in more productive, creating new things that are cool, right? Um, so I'm looking at this thinking, wow, you know, the smart contracts um, can do all of these things that, you know, they're tamper proof, right? You can build systems and services that don't need to be protected by firewalls. They can't get encrypted by ransomware. They're unstoppable like the internet itself. Um, it simplifies R&D. And of course, these, these other magical things like you, you can make smart contracts autonomous, right? They can run under the control of a, of a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, or they can be 
non-updatable, just like these rails that stay the same and that everybody knows what they're getting. And um, there's no human or company that can control them. That has immense potential for things like financial rails and DeFi. And then of course, you, know, you can process tokens and value as tokens and, and identity and things like that. So I'm looking at this thinking, wow, you know, um, I, I, you know, one day we're gonna see a blockchain singularity and blockchain singularity is gonna occur when every system is built on a blockchain. Every system and service is built and running on a blockchain. Um, and, you know, by which I mean like all these, you know, say, I mean, obviously all the services like enterprise services, Salesforce, um, social networks, everything, financial systems, exchanges, and of course, enterprise systems. Because um, the benefits or the kind of the opportunity around de decentralized technology, around automation through smart contracts, around e equitability of those systems the the case for doing that dramatically outweighs the cost of all the bureaucracy and the IT overhead and all of the inefficiency that the existing systems have built in. Well, look, I mean, if you build something on Amazon Web Services, it's completely insecure. It can get hacked. The developers maintaining it, even if you don't get hacked, the developers maintaining it can um, go crazy or they can go on holiday and the credit card can expire. You know, because you obviously pay for your Amazon Web Services account with a credit card. You go on holiday, you come back, and everything's gone. The data has been deleted, right? Because your credit card expired and you're out of touch. Um, and the, but the biggest problem I think is, you know, security. Like, you know, think about like a year and a half ago, the colonial pipeline hack in America involved hackers putting ransomware and all these machines that controlled that infrastructure and the oil stopped flowing from Texas to the re petroleum refineries on the Eastern seaboard. And uh, the petroleum ran out and there were these huge tailbacks of gas stations and so on. Um, you know, you, you can't run uh, the world on this kind of, you know, flaky infrastructure that can get hacked and encrypted with ransomware and can just stop working and things like that. And, you know, there are 8 billion people in the in the world now, and, and you can't support that kind of population without huge um, automation using information systems, right? And people forget, like, you take away the computers, um, like, the vast majority of people on Earth die, <laughs> Right, computers are absolutely essential uh, today to supporting um, human life. That's it. Computers so, and bees. Yeah, and bees. Yeah, but, but yeah. Don't get me started on that one. Like the bees disappear, we've got big problems. Um, so it, it doesn't make sense that we're going to be building with this kind of old school traditional IT that really evolved from the earliest days of um, computerization. You know, and my first computer had eight kilobytes of memory. It doesn't make sense. You know that. A lot of the way we build stuff today is, you know, uh, related to the way things evolved over time. It wasn't like, you know, there was a clean piece of paper. What's the best way of devising a platform to build on? So for me, blockchain is that future platform, right? Tamper-proof, unstoppable, you have autonomous code, tokenized things. I mean, it's all these huge advantages. So for me, you know, uh, in the end, you know, um, People won't be building on Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure or using their own servers and data centers or anything like that. People will build everything on blockchain. Blockchain will store all the data, process it, serve the user experiences. And that's what a world computer is to me. But of course, to th this entails a blockchain that probably will be processing billions of transactions a second, storing unimaginably large amounts of data, right? It's very unlike the blockchains we have today um, with the exception of the internet computer. And back then, you know, 2014, 2015, I was like, you know, deeply embedded with the Ethereum community and spent a lot of time, um, you know, proposing ways of uh, uh, making faster, more scalable blockchains. And, you know, really Definity, started using the name Definity in uh, early 2015. Definity, of course, is a shortening of decentralized infinity. And Divinity was really just a research project. You know, there was um, nothing more to it. And the aim of the research project was to enable a faster, better Ethereum 2.0. And in fact, if you look at Ethereum 2 now, it's like an early, early 2015 Divinity design, right? It was me that came out with this idea of using a random beacon, albeit it works in a different way, using advanced cryptography and using the random numbers to you know, select committees of nodes, um, that, that, you know, um, produce the next block and things like that. So that those are really early, you know, what you're seeing now with Ethereum, kind of a reflection of some of the early work. And if you go back to DevCon 1, like type in DevCon 1, Dominic Williams, 
um, you'll, you'll see a bunch of presentations um, from me talking about, uh, you know, kind of crypto theory and early consensus and so on. But um, at some point it became apparent that, um, you know, people wanted to, you know, Ethereum was going to have just to be built, right? And there wasn't the money or the bandwidth or even necessarily the belief to, to engage in the kind of research that I wanted to pursue, um, which was to, to create a world computer, you know, an everything computer, a blockchain that could host all of humanity's information systems. Most people thought the, the idea was absurd and it wouldn't be technically possible. So um, I spent a lot of time, you know, continuing to do my research and trying to persuade people this was a good idea. Um, and it wasn't really until 2016, I had a 24% stake in, a, in a incub an incubator, which was focused on the crypto space uh, called String Labs. And for a bunch of reasons, the projects it was pursuing, it was back at the time, uh, ran into regulatory difficulties. It wasn't going to be possible to continue, um, practically speaking. So I was like, right, seize the moment. Hey, guys, this is the time. Finally, let's, let's pivot and, and let's, let's um, you know, incubate the Definity project, right? <laughs> and let's create a world computer kind of thing. Albeit, to begin with, the ambitions were much reined in and it was just going to be a governed blockchain with this thing called the network nervous system, a DAO. So, um, you know, did some work in 2016, um, trying to see how this thing could be got off the ground. Uh, Definity Foundation was created in Zoog originally in, in October 2016. Um, we ran a, an ICO, a public ICO, um, February 2017, one of the first ICOs. <laughs> we didn't raise much in crypto and in, in, in Bitcoin and ETH compared to the later ones, but what we raised went up in value. Um, and obviously, people who participated in, in um, that public ICO, you know, obviously made great returns. Uh, even now in the crypto bear market, they're still hundreds of times up. Um, and then, you know, just got got down to it. You know, we started building, you know, we started hiring some kind of early superstars. Like, have you ever heard of WebAssembly? WebAssembly is this virtual machine. It's the virtual machine of the internet. It's in all the web browsers now. You know, the future of web apps is really WebAssembly. Um, when you're... Uh, you know, um, doing things in the web browser now, oftentimes there's WebAssembly involved. Like if you've got a Dropbox, there's a WebAssembly applet in the page that's compressing and decompressing the data that's going to their servers. Um, you can get WebAssembly video applets, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and eventually, you know, increasingly, the, 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 your web experience will be based on WebAssembly. So guy, one of the early sort of couple of people, I believe, involved in designing that, but um, one of them was Andreas Rosberg, who's a senior guy at Google. Like, you know, he... he he got hired, and of course, the internet computer, smart contracts, a, a web assembly, right? So you can compile in any language and you create this web assembly that runs on the internet computer blockchain. Um, ben Lin, who is the L from BLS cryptography, again from Google. Um, Timo Hanke, who is from the you know uh, early crypto guy in the Bitcoin space, particularly, you know, I think he was the CTO of Terrahashing and he devised the ASIC boost algorithm. And so we sort of assembled these. Um, uh, people and um, got, got down to it. And then I uh, had a prototype kind of running at the end of 2017, uh, raised a whole lot of money in 2018 um, and scaled out. And you know, we quickly became, the Definity Foundation quickly became uh, uh, you know, crypto's largest R&D operation by far. Um, and then in, you know, we had research centers in Palo Alto, San Francisco and, 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 and Zurich. The Zurich thing really got built out. We got a current CTO, a guy called Jan Kamenich, a very famous cryptographer. Um, we hired him. He was leading crypto research at IBM. We got him across to lead the Zurich office. And then a whole bunch of, uh, probably truth be told, we kind of cleaned out IBM's uh, cryptography department. All the senior guys came across. Um, and then we started getting a lot of people from Google and from the Zurich ETH here and hiring people around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, we started building what is now, you know, the internet computer. Uh, there's an expression in venture capital from Silicon Valley, which is, um, you know, don't don't mistake a clear view for a near thing, right? Like, so for me, it was like, well, it's obvious, right? You know, um, you just, we just need to build a, a, a blockchain with infinite scale, can scale infinitely, is, you know, tens of thousands of times more efficient, um, where smart contracts can interact with HTTP to serve user experiences directly into browsers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, well, we can take these different technical approaches and uh, you know uh, apply cryptography in these different ways. Um, and of course the devil's in the detail. I mean, we can use a reverse gas, we can do this, but 
there's nothing in the internet computer that's shared with any other blockchain. It's all, you know, um, just built for one specific purpose. And um, it involves a lot of very uh, complex cryptography, for example. And so it took, you know, it took much longer than I uh, hoped <laughs> to actually build the thing and launch it. And we came out of our sort of proverbial garage, if you like, in May 2021 and, and, and launched this thing. And, you know, it's, it's um, been an interesting journey, but the internet computer exists. And uh, what many people don't know, because there's a lot of people that are very worried about the internet computer. What does it mean? Is it going to disrupt the status quo? Um, and, you know, it's well documented by people like CryptoLeaks.info. Um, you know, some of the things we've been subjected to, like you know, lawsuits created by law firms, funded by competitors, um, you know, crazy articles that have been sort of instigated by Sam Bankman fried and, and price manipulation on FTX, all this kind of stuff. We came out into a real, uh, you know, uh, shit show firestorm, <laughs> somehow survived it. But, you know, despite, you know, no one really talking about the internet computer, because I'm afraid to say the crypto press tends to be very partisan and represent vested interests. And um, the blockade on the internet computer is a real thing. Despite all that, we're the biggest blockchain in the world by transaction volume today. I mean, you know, many people listening will be very surprised. You know, go to dashboard.internetcomputer.org and uh, you'll see we're doing about half a billion transactions a day at the moment. It was higher before Christmas. Things coming back up again. Um, and, you know, you'll see some other blockchains that claim bigger numbers like Solana, but they're not real transactions. If I'm lying, Solana Labs, hey, sue me for defamation, but they're fake. They're actually protocol messages they're counting. Like many things in this space, they tend to be fake. And I can tell you straight away that internet computer transactions are not fake. And they're real. Stat padding in crypto and layer ones and layer twos is a real thing. And, you know, if you don't have a million users already one month after launch, you know, unfortunately, the expectations just keep rising and rising every time somebody does it higher and better. And, and it's, a lot of it is interpretation of data, as you said. Um, but half a billion transaction data is not insignificant. Tell us about where's that coming from? Who's building on the internet computer or what applications are running? You know, tell us more about what sits underneath that. Well, so um, it's easy to, easy, easily understood. So currently most of the, um, there's a huge variety of stuff being built on the internet computer, which is ex extraordinary when you consider that this is organic growth. Like this growth has occurred after our token price like fell 99% after price manipulation and all kinds of other stuff. We've had articles in the New York Times saying we were a rug pull. We've had class actions created by you know, Avalanche's sort of henchmen lawyers that they gave half a billion dollars to, to attack competitors and so on. Um, you know, I mean, we've really, uh, you know, been, been uh, on the sharp end and the crypto press refuses to report on the biggest blockchain in the world with the biggest R&D operation in crypto and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, despite, and, and in addition to that, you know, we have, we're a foundation, we're a not-for-profit, but we do have a grants program where we give out relatively tiny amounts to people that want to build on the internet computer, a few thousand dollars. Compare that to what happened in, say, the Solana ecosystem, you know, where, you know, what Sam was doing was, um, you know, he stole like $4 billion of customer assets, and then he invested that in four, 500, excuse me, 500 companies, um, a lot of them in the Solana ecosystem. And, you know, you could just be a small team, and it's like, hey, guys, um, you know, here's some Alameda, Research, here's several million dollars. Uh, you know, FTX Ventures, here's several million dollars. Solana Labs, here's several million dollars. And then they go to VCs in Silicon Valley who are completely bought into the whole thing, nonsense, and they were giving several million dollars more. And then you hear this big press release, oh, there's someone building on Solana, which really means building an Amazon Web Services, of course, right, to keep the tokens on Solana. And they got all this venture capital, and then the press is all like, wow, look at this, you know. Um, we don't do that. Like, you know, I mean, the, the we've given out less in grants a the total amount in grants we've given out is a fraction of what Sam and his, you know, the VC backers, you know, have, have invest in a single Solana project. Yet, you know, you look at the stuff building on the internet computer, it's real, it's incredible, it's, you know, groundbreaking. Um, there are real users. Um, the transaction volume is higher. And there's all these people building these incredible things. It's, it's organic growth. And that's happened despite the blockade in the crypto press, which refuses to even say the word internet computer. And of course, we know now how that was done. We were seeing things like, you know, the bribe that was given to the CEO of the block by Sam. You know, all this stuff slowly coming out. Um, but, you know, despite the fact that, a, you know, crypto press blockade never mentioned the internet computer, 
um, the, the, the crazy stuff in the New York Times, the price manipulation, the class actions by um, this law firm funded to the tune of half a billion dollars by Avalanche. Despite all of that, right? Um, and despite the fact that we don't pay people to build on the internet computer blockchain, actually when developers check out the functionality of a true world computer blockchain and everything computer and they see what it can do, they start building and they don't go elsewhere. And uh, that's why the internet computer, despite everything that's been thrown at it, um, is the biggest blockchain in the world by transaction volume. Now you ask, where does the transaction volume come from? Well, there's all these people building and they're building on chain. So here's something to consider. And this is why Solana is having to fake its transaction numbers, which I believe is fraud, but let's not go there. Um, the reason is that when somebody says they're building on Solana, your listeners may be surprised to know it doesn't mean building on Solana. It's misleading advertising. Like, there's no such thing as building on Solana. Like when you hear a Web3 service is built on Solana, that's a 100% lie. And it's difficult to grasp, right? But that's blockchain is smoke and mirrors. What it really means is they're building on Amazon Web Services typically, and they're keeping some tokens and tiny clips of data on the blockchain. Like the user experience, the thing you're interacting with isn't coming off the blockchain, it's coming off Amazon Web Services. The data that you store, even your NFTs, that's not on the blockchain, it's on Amazon Web Services. And if the developer you know, forgets to update his credit card when it expires or goes crazy and or goes bankrupt, your NFT disappears. All your game content, all your social media content, it's on Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. And if the developer wants to delete it or change it, they can do it anytime. And that's always been the, the, con the, the kind of contested point around whether blockchains or decentralized infrastructure is likely to scale because people talk about latency or they talk about capacity or they talk about throughput, they talk about fees and so on. And there have been a number of different architectures proposed for how we, how we improve that, whether it be sharding, whether it be side chains, whether we have layer two yes. pro scale, scaling yeah. protocols on top, but but you you guys have another way of addressing that, right? Or well, that's 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 the problem. Sure, sure. About. I mean, look. So I mean, that's you know, that's the reason all these transactions are happening on the internet computer. Like, there's a, there's a there's, I mean, I always go on about open chat. I shouldn't because there are hundreds of amazing things. But I was involved in setting up that team early on, and it's like a chat service that runs on the internet computer. And the reason I'd helped set up that team and bootstrap that project uh, was I wanted like. Um, you know, it's a bit like Tesla did this kind of like the reason they got the roads they were like a hardcore smackdown. I think it's the expression for, for the ice cars, right? Like, don't don't imagine that you know your internal combustion engine car is, is the fastest. Like this this is what an electric car can do. So I, I wanted to um, you know um, you know, challenge people's preconceptions in the strongest way, and I wanted someone to build like a chat service on the internet computer where every single chat message is a transaction, like a Bitcoin transaction. And where all of the chat messages and the images and the video messages are stored on the blockchain. And um, that runs. But you can imagine, I mean, that's got like, you know, some tens of thousands of users. Obviously, they're chatting away and creating messages and there are group chats. And so that's what, an example of where like transactions are coming from. Um, you've also got things that I've really, you know, that, that are really beginning to take off. Like someone created a, uh, an internet computer TikTok kind of thing. It's called Hot or Not. Um, I don't know how when they stream the video, it's coming off the internet computer, whether they're, you, you could basically, you, on the internet computer, you can pre-finalize transactions, if that makes sense. So you can have a transaction that returns a block of video or a transaction that returns the HTML page that's rendered in your browser. You can pre-finalize it. So the point is, because it's pre-finalized, um, you know, when you interact with a smart contract and say, give me the web page, it just gives you the, the result of a pre-finalized transaction. And, and basically something in your web browser without getting into the technicalities is verifying that. Um, and it's all based on the single chain key cryptography. And basically these uh, these assets are like, the finalizations are pre-certified and you can verify if you've got the internet computer's um, public key. The, the, the blockchain itself has a kind of public key called a chain key, a little bit different to a public key. But, and you can check the signatures on these things. So. Um, you know, it's just going to go up and up. I mean, I think, you know, uh, it's, it's beginning to rise again after this Christmas break. I, I, I'm sure we're going to easily surpass a billion transactions a day by the end of the year. But I mean, we should be getting, I mean, it really wouldn't get exciting because we're doing like a billion transactions now. Um, and, you know, uh, that's just part of it, of course. Like, what's the cost? You know, you have to have a blockchain that's very efficient. So one of the other reasons, I mean, look, I mean, the internet computer is the only blockchain in the world where smart contracts can interact with HTTP and credit user experience. So if your blockchain can't do that, well, that means you've got to create the service on Amazon Web Services because you need to create the user experience, right? 
Um, but there's more to it too. Like how much does it cost to store a, a phone photo, say on a blockchain? Um, well, you know, take a photo with your phone, it's about 3.3 meg. Um, back in September last year, and that's the last time I have stats, it cost you $110,000 to store a phone photo on Ethereum. I, you just couldn't do it technically. There'd be so many individual transactions to write it to the blockchain and forget it. Probably, you probably choke the entire blockchain. But if you, in principle, it cost you $110,000. Solana is like $400. Again, it's very unlikely you could store any significant quantity of photos on, on, on Solana. And anyway, no one can spend $400 per photo a year. Internet computers like 1.6 cents. You know, it's like you know, 20,000 X improvement in, in efficiency there. Um, and so people are just unaware of that. They hear about, you know, blockchains like Solana being promoted as these hugely efficient things. Complete nonsense. It's all just marketing. Literal, just nonsense. And, um, uh, it, it, you know, there's just no way you could even, even if Solana smart contracts were, were capable of serving web experiences and, you know, so that users could directly interact with smart contracts securely, um, you know, you, you still couldn't store the data on Solana. So what people say is, oh, well, we don't need that. It's Web3. We're going to store it on IPFS or Arweave or something. Yeah, honestly, it doesn't really work. I mean, it's another lie. I mean, if you've got, like, so if you want to create like a social network, right? Like, you really, everyone's, I mean, I, I don't use Facebook anymore, but, you know, back in the day, you know, you've got this news feed, right? That news feed is it's what's known as dynamic data. It's structured dynamic data. And that entire, you know, that, that structured dynamic data in its entirety has to be processed in real time by the, by the code. So if you want to create a social network using smart contracts, you know, you can't take that newsfeed data and stick it into a file on Arweave or IPFS, which anyway are backed by Amazon Web Services, right? I mean, it doesn't work. So it's another one of these kind of things. Like, I think it's difficult for people out there because, you know, the blockchain industry has become an absolute expert at giving people these like misleading, completely misleading, this, this misleading false advertising. And it sounds all right. Like, yeah, you know, like Web3 is about multi-chain and combining all these different components and we're gonna have the smart contracts here and then we're gonna put the files on IPFS. But they don't tell you the whole story. Like if you want to do real Web3, you know, that, that means you've got to find a way of hosting your social network on the blockchain. Now, of course it doesn't, the, the distinction's lost on most people because, you know, what we talked to people, we did surveys actually to try and understand this. It was staggering, like 99% plus of people in the blockchain industry, crypto journalists, mainstream media, media journalists who are interested, retail investors, institutional investors, even a lot of developers, they, they don't understand that when they hear built on Solana, built on this, built on that, they actually think it is built on, on the blockchain. They don't realize that it's built on Amazon Web Services. That's where the user experience mm. comes from. That's where all the data lives. That's where all the data processing yeah. happens. It's just tokens and NFTs. And even the NFT is a token which has a reference to content that actually typically is, is also, um, you, you know, on the cloud too. So, and even the blockchains themselves run on the bloody cloud. Like the internet computer is created a bit like Bitcoin using this thing called proof of useful work, but obviously a different system, but it's dedicated hardware. Like independent parties own this, these things called node machines. Um, which are built to a public public spec, and these things can be combined together by the protocol, um, and, and contribute essentially to, to, to scaling out the internet computer blockchain. Um, but you know, otherwise, everyone just runs these proof of stake blockchains, and they say it's decentralized because they have all these validators. But you know, it's running on like in reality, like two or three big tech cloud platforms. Right? It's not centralized. Like you know, the other day, Hetzner, the big cloud in Europe, said, "Hey." Um, we don't want any more, more Solana validators. You know, they're too chatty using up bandwidth and compute resources. Um, and they pressed a button and 40% of Solana's network went offline. More than a thousand validators, which is the perfect illustration of how, you know, even if, well, I mean, look at Ethereum, 500,000 validators, they celebrated it. But, you know, if all your validators are running on Amazon Web Services and Google and Hetzner, that's not really like, like that's not decentralization. That's just people replicating data and computation on one platform. And, you know, Hesna said, we don't, we don't want these Solana validators anymore. It's against our terms of service to run a, a Bitcoin client on, on, on the Hetzner network. They literally ran a script, identified all the Hetzner nodes, pressed a button, and they all went offline in a puff of smoke. And this is, therein lies the challenge of decentralization when, when the infrastructure is, is hard to take down or where the infrastructure can be taken down, that is a significant threat to your ability to provide something that's unstoppable. 
I, I mentioned uh, you mentioned interoperability. It's, it's, sorry, yeah. As so you mentioned interoperability in the story there, because I think that that's I'm really interested in your take there, because clearly you've identified that there are some parties or some some sort of technologies that exist in Web three today that probably won't go the distance, or that may may not survive much much longer in terms of their ability to be technically efficient, financially efficient, and so on and so forth. Are you a are you an ICP maximalist, or do you see that there is going to be room for multiple blockchains that can interact? No, I'm not an ICP maximalist. I'm a blockchain maximalist, right? You know, I'm not here for the money. I didn't get into this industry um, to create some st stupid token and tell everyone a lie. And um, that's just, you know, that's not what uh, I got into this industry for. That's not why people working at Definity got into this industry, um, which is why I think it's very important for, you know, people trying to understand the blockchain ecosystem to look at the teams involved in these different projects. Um you know, the people that work here have been, you know, working in tech for many years and oftentimes are like senior computer science and cryptography researchers and so on and huge numbers of, you know, senior engineers. They're not just like fly-by-night, quick money, crypto bros. Um, and, you know, um, so when I say I'm a blockchain maximalist, I mean that, look, I, you know, well, firstly, like, we, you know, we're, we're working to integrate and extend and enhance Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, a lot of our work um, at the moment uh, is centered around that. So we're not, you know, we, we don't want to see like one world where everything runs on the internet computer. We want the internet computer to be successful, but we believe in a multi-chain future. Albeit, we also believe that um, there's no room for fakery. And, and, and like, we're kind of like, we're kind of horrified at these regulators who just obsess about these things like, you know, is, 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 a, is a blockchain is a blockchain's native token of security. Like, stop, you know, our view, our message to regulators is like, well, first of all, it's not a security, it's a, it's a digital commodity if it's, an, if it's created by a genuine decentralized network, albeit not, not all are, but um, like we can do things today to protect, um, you know, retail investors. And that starts obviously with looking a bit more closely at some of this CFI stuff, not getting bamboozled by con artists like Sam Bankman Freed. Um, who, you know, has done, you know, all kinds of bad things to us. Um, stopping them, you know, somehow, I mean, you know, you heard like Sam, basically one third of the U.S. Congress has taken money from Sam bankman fried 196 members of Congress took money from Sam bankman fried Yeah. Um, you know, his money went everywhere in the crypto media, went everywhere in like, you know, industry research uh, outfits, um, mainstream media. And it just distorted the entire space like deal with the CFI guys and let the DeFi guys do do their thing like ethereum DeFi didn't fall down uh in despite the stress and enormous stress placed on it the problems came from centralized finance CFI, right um, yeah the, yeah, in, the inter that. interoperability or the kind of the in interfaces between the decentralized web3 world and the, the world that's gone before and yeah. you know it's entirely possible for us to exist as you know, fully crypto um, sort of cap anarchistic financiers, yeah, completely can. off grid, completely on chain, completely pseudonymous if we choose to. But then we do have the responsibility sometimes of paying for school fees or being able yeah. to pay taxes. You need to be a gateway. And so on. Yeah. So that that, that you need to be a gateway. So you can't avoid it. But and you can so regulate it, it, right? You can yes. regulate it. You yes. can stop people. Like, you know, I can't even tell you like the way Sam worked in Silicon Valley. Like he had by the end of it, all of these VCs brainwashed and, and investing in these kind of junk projects. And, and they just creating this crazy flywheel where, you know, the aim was like Sam had taken like that $4 billion, right? And put it into 500 companies and there were other people doing similar things as well. The, once you've done that, like, you know, Sam needed the Solana token to go up to fill the hole and to pay back the, the assets he'd stolen, right? So, um, but at the same time, that money that he had available was, you know, gave him immense power and the influence he exerted over those hundreds of companies and the VCs through all these companies getting invest investments and they thought, wow, this is really working. And so, you know, big venture capital firms started investing alongside. And even like really conservative, um, you know, VCs like Union Square Ventures um, plowed hundreds of millions, I believed, into multi-coin capital. Right, Carl Solana said, which is a bit like the last time that guy tried something, it was with EOS. And now he found a way of doing it with Solana, right? And he he was, um, yeah, he he basically was getting all this institutional capital, buying Solana, right? And then you know that was driving the price up. 
Like it was, that fund is multiple in capital, like 90, 80, 90%, probably, you know, Sol, Solana, right? And so getting this vast amounts of money in, spending it on Sols, putting the price up. And then at the end of the year, I think was what I heard a rumor that, you know, he said, right, look, the price of Sol's gone up. I made all this money and he paid himself what amounted to like a billion dollar bonus. <laughs> and then the price crashed and all this, right? I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I heard. All, all the LPs are out. But that's how the flywheel worked, right? The flywheel was a kind of fake thing where you basically, you would, well, in this case, most of the money came from retail, like, you know, three hours capital, um, took all that money from retail effectively by that scheme, you know, and they plowed it into Avalanche and Near. Um, uh, you know, uh, obviously Sam's empire was focused on Solana originally, but they diversified into Near and Aptos. Um, and then his Barry's says, I don't know enough about that, but some stuff went on there. And the um, the, the thing is what you do when you've, you've done that, you've taken that money, right? You've borrowed it and all these kind of funny things going on. You basically really, now you're on the hook. You know, you need your stuff that you've invested in to work. So now you start doing all this kind of like shady, sketchy stuff, like paying bribes to people in the media effectively so that they write kind things about you and they write bad things about people your competitors. So that's that's how the internet computer got shut out of the crypto media because we're seen as, as disrupt, potentially disruptive. And we've had the brakes put on the progress of what is in, incredibly promising technology because of market intermediaries and capitalism, which yeah. are two of the things that so this is, yeah. Web3 are designed to, to uninvent. Or exactly. To, to it's antithetical. And I think this is the lie that's been sold. So I'm, you know, I'm obviously wanting to see. So if you ask me now, am I an ICP maximalist? No. But I, you know, I also think that, you know, I get a lot of pressure. Like I mentioned some of the dis differences. I remember back on Twitter, I was like, well, here's the cost of storing a phone photo, on Ethereum, Solana, internet computer. And, you know, you get these people like, well, that's toxic. You, we're all in this together, bro. And you're doing comparisons. And it's like, well, wait a second. So you guys, right, you can take billions of dollars stolen from retail. You can um, create this kind of Ponzi flywheel where you're investing in these companies and paying for partnerships that you put in the press and getting everyone so excited. Lock us out of the crypto press, right? Manipulate the token price, create lawsuits against us, but we're not even allowed to mention the technical differences in blockchains. I mean, that's kind of... So, you know, if I look at that, yeah, I call BS on the whole thing. I think it's got nothing to do with blockchain. I think the people behind these projects have nothing to do with the real blockchain venture. They have nothing to do with people like me. Uh, who, who got into the industry, you know, a long time ago and, and, and spent large parts of their lives researching the uh, technical means for creating something like the internet computer, um, who believe in, in, in the crypto project and, and the way it can improve society, believe in the technology. These are like people that are just obsessed with creating a chimera that can be pushed to retail investors to take their money. And... So in that sense, I'm, you know, I'm an IC maximalist in that, you know, I, I'm angry with what's being done because these guys are corrupting the blockchain industry and, and, and what I believe in. And they've done it very successfully. And even now, if you look on CoinMarketCap, I can tell you like the majority of the projects there are just kind of selling junk visions. I don't want to single them out, but there's a lot of blockchains that say we're specialized in doing this thing. And, and you know, to, to the retail investor, that sounds like, that sounds... Logical, like here's a, here's a blockchain that specializes in NFTs. Here's a blockchain that specializes in games. Here, and oh, and in their mind, it's like, well, if you create a blockchain that specialized in one of these niches, it must have an advantage in that niche. And look, they don't know. And to some extent, that might be true, right? That there may be specific technical technical functionality that an app chain you may wish to perform in some. It sounds, you see, it sounds another. logical, right? It sounds logical, but it's complete nonsense. I mean, uh, look, a, a computer. What you know, the future of. Um, Blockchain is really about, you know, world computers, uh, everything computers, right? These things are just decentralized computers that you can build amazing shit on. And, you know, one day you can run a Web3 service, for example, under the control of a DAO, uh, what's happening already on this internet computer now. And, and it becomes almost like an autonomous thing. It's like a Bitcoin, you know, you've got like a social network. It's like a Bitcoin or something. It's incredible. Um, but, you know, a computer is a general purpose device, Right. There's no such thing as a, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, you have an ASIC that just does one very simple thing. A computer is a general purpose device. You have a, you know, you have memory, a processor, a this, a that, 
right? And if it can and, be performant um, enough, you can have that be flexible across multiple applications. Exactly. If you can get and the cost point low, if you can get the latency it, low, if you can get the throughput yeah. sufficient, you can run that for games, you can run that for banking transactions, you can run that for Excel spreadsheets, you can run that for business applications. Is the, That's precisely the right. And, and in fact, if you did create a specific version of a computer, well, you know, you wouldn't just be focusing on making a an efficient general purpose computer and you'd waste all your time. I mean, you, you know, an AMD chip, like, or an Intel chip that's in these machines that power the internet. When I say power the internet, I mean, not the internet, but, you know, services like YouTube and so on. So, like, you know, they're not like, you know, there's literally a YouTube um, AMD chip or something, right? It's, like, it's a computer, for God's sakes. You know, and the, and the blockchain is is a kind of like decentralized computer, right? And, you know, you have smart contracts with logic and they store data and it has to be processed. And, you know, if you've got something like the internet computer, you, you know, the smart contracts are also creating user experiences because, you know, they're doing everything. They've taken over from the cloud, right? And so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those tough things. Like, you know, uh, there's a lot of junk, I mean, some of the stuff I'm just like, you know, draw drops and I look at it, but, it, you know, these memes go out there and it, it's tough because, you know, a lot of these things involve um, technical knowledge that it's difficult for even pretty educated people to acquire, right, and make these judgments. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of crypto runs in the mode of a complexity scam. And the only way you can really bust through that is by... Hey guys, we lost Dominic at the point where the only way you can bust through that is. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get him back in a minute. We've had we've had a bit of an outage on StreamYard, which is ironic given that we of systems going down and being able to have things be unstoppable. Our own broadcast has been stopped midway through. Oh, Dominic, you're back. I don't know whether that was. <laughs> I don't know which end that happened. It just started talking about this the is the infrastructure example. and in the middle. This is <laughs> it needs to run on the internet before. computer, which, by the way, is doing. Uh, there's people building like all kinds of crazy video streaming stuff on the internet computer. Um, so hopefully, one time we'll have like a blockchain based one of these I'll things. I'll be open to doing this anyways. next time on, on ICP if we can. I, the irony is the first time I've ever had an outage doing a live stream and it's oh, well, on, the, on the show when we're talking about all of these issues. I really did it to try and prove to you why it needs to be on the blockchain. <laughs> right? Honestly, the universe works in some very mysterious ways sometimes. Um, I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions to you before we okay. go to the Q&A and, and there's definitely there's some heat in the chat now. It's like, where did you guys go? What the hell happened? Oh, the irony. There you go. I'll tell you. I'll answer those questions. Ask Those are the right questions because it's absolutely crazy what happened. So let's go. Um, the fir first one is what what you've identified, obviously, a huge amount of the challenges that some people may or may not have been aware of with, with Web3 today, things that we're already struggling in, in scaling. But what more do you see is required for us to see appropriate scaling and wider use of Web3? Well, I think this is, you know, it's already happening. It all works fine. Um, you know, that's why, you know, you don't hear about the internet computer on, in, in the crypto press. We're banned, you know, because it does already work. And people are worried about um, the status quo getting disrupted and billions of dollars of tokens held in these blockchains that are, are tens of thousands of times less efficient, run on Amazon Web Services um, and, can't, and can't even host stuff directly. You have to, you know. So, um, you know, today... Uh, Here's some cool things to look at. I mean, obviously, uh, there's a whole bunch of like social network type stuff running on the internet computer. There's games running on the internet computer. There's metaverse. There's video streaming working on the internet computer. Um, you know, uh, it's still scaling out. It's still uh, improving, but you know, it's already working. Like, there's already huge amounts of activity on on the internet computer blockchain, which is a world computer, a kind of everything computer. Um, uh, you know, new stuff coming all, all the time. There's huge projects that you don't hear about, like huge, uh, you know, MMO games that are being built on the internet computer that are, you know, nearing production. Um, we'll be seeing later this year. I mean, there's, there's video streaming projects. There's people creating like decentralized Netflix, decentralized YouTube. Um, there's a thing called Hot or Not. They haven't probably tokenized it yet, but that's going to be really exciting. Um, that's running on the internet computer. Um, there's and, and actually, a lot of these projects are going to use this new technology coming along called the service nervous system, which means that. So here's something that you, people probably often people are aware of. Uh, the Internet computer blockchain itself runs under the full control of a DAO called the network nervous system. It's a very advanced DAO. It's not like any DAO you see on another blockchain. 
and all the node machines that you know are combined by the ICP protocol and create the internet computer blockchain. Um, those those obviously run software that implements the protocol. Um, that's updated by the DAO. So those kind of machines are like black boxes, and you know the DAO can update them. Um, so you know the internet computer is like an adaptive blockchain. It so you have decentralized people. governance. You have yeah. um, DAO DAO based upgrades to the yeah. software. Tran transparent, I assume, yeah. visible for all to see yeah. where those votes were made and yeah. so on and so forth. And, and so to give you an idea, like we're doing like two hard forks a week on average through that governance system. Like you propose the protocol updates, and if 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 the if the proposal is adopted, that the network nervous system is automatically applying those on the node machines. And that means the, the internet computer uh, blockchain is able to, to adapt and evolve very, very quickly. That same technology, the network nervous system technology, by the way, you can find it at nns.ic0.app. It's all running from the blockchain. The user experience comes from the small contracts that create that DAO. Go and check it out. But and you can see all the proposals. And you can also see them on dashboard.internetcomputer.org. You can see, see the proposals that are updating the internet computer. But that same technology that's been proven now in, tw in, in 20 months of production, um, running the internet computer blockchain itself um, is being adapted and, and individual Web3 services are now going to assign control to these things and they're going to run something called a decentralization sale. So something like OpenChat, um, you know, that will run under the control of a community DAO called a service nervous system, a very specialized advanced one that can actually update the, the code. Um, the, when it does a decentralization sale to distribute the governance tokens, the proceeds are actually held in the DAO. They're not given to the founders. So it's not like an ICO. Um, the, the proceeds are held under the control of the community. It's like crowdfunding 3.0. And then they reserve a lot of governance tokens for users that help with advocacy and content moderation and things like that in those public groups. And they're probably going to, I have to talk to them, but you know, they're, they're probably going to give out the first 5 million users that help advocate for other users and um, help with those kind of tasks. They're going to be giving them governance tokens to make the users founders, right? And part of, part of a huge virtual industrious team that makes these that service succeed. And there's, I think there's like about 25 superstar projects that are waiting to use that technology. Like it's all about to start happening in the next uh, month or two. And then there are another 100 projects. You know, they're still not, maybe not the superstar ones, but they're still pretty promising. Um, they're going to do it. And of course, when other people see what's going on on the internet computer, um, there's going to this thing's that this this sort of decentralization sale kind of full decentralization thing is going to really start running, and that's only possible because these things run 100% on the blockchain. They're really built on the internet computer blockchain. They're not built on Amazon Web Services. It's not like when other blockchains say it's built on this blockchain. They're really like building you know Amazon Web Services and just keeping some tokens on the blockchain and some tiny clips of data. Now these things are running on the blockchain, and because they're running on the blockchain, that they're built from smart contracts, they can be updated by this, these digital, you know, centralized autonomous organizations, these digital democracies, right? Mm -hmm. They can actually push the changes to the code and the whole thing end to end runs as, as like a giant DAO in a way. And, and, you know, the governance tokens actually control the whole thing end to end. That's where we've been going. We've been working on this for years and years and um, that revolution's about to hit. I, I think Open Chat's one of the, gonna be one of the first ones over the top that's gonna do this. Um, and it's gonna be revolutionary. I mean, it's one of the first, like, Fully decentralized, uh, you know, Web three service, which will end up. I mean, it's already got you know many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of users. End up with millions of users or hundreds of millions of users running. You know, you can imagine like something like Facebook running under the control of a DAO. There's no company. There's no board of uh, directors. There's no CEO. There's nobody that. There's no tech team that can go in there and just change it. The whole thing is like like an open source project. But really, like, really, it's yeah, a really I mean, interesting concept, and and yeah. I'm, I think it's interesting in two ways. Firstly, interesting, it's interesting technically because obviously that that's that's kind of the not the end. It's goal, challenging to do. One of, yeah, exactly. One one of the most interesting things technically that you could see Web three deliver. Also, it's interesting from a sociological perspective in terms of does democracy really end up really end up with a better organization? Right, Make a DAO is a great example. Have we seen a community of of you know lay people? give better rates and better financial fiscal policy than a central bank's risk risk officer or or a lending bank's risk officer and, and make a dow still here right they've had their struggles but they've got there so and, so and, see, and by the way just to say i mean if you look at the network nervous system that controls the internet computer network um it's what you'd call a delegated liquid democracy right so people stake icp to create these things called voting neurons 
Uh, the voting power is proportional to the amount of stuff you state and the length of time you've lo locked it up for. Um, but you, you can vote, make your neuron vote automatically by making it follow, configuring it to follow other neurons. And um, if you can't do all the votes yourself, you're going to do that because you want to earn the voting rewards, right? Um, and it, it just works very well. I mean, you know, uh, so far, you know, it's made all the right decisions, adopted all the right proposals. Um, it, you know, if you wanted to, you could put a proposal into the network nervous system, it's permissionless, that had a protocol update that deleted all the data on the blockchain. Right? All those, you know, which of course, in the, in, in the case of the internet computer, well computer blockchain means like deleting all these like, uh, you know, uh, Web3 services and social networks and games and, and now the new generation of DeFi. Um, but, but the reality is that, that it's designed in such a way that it would never adopt such a proposal. Um, but you do get a lot of controversy. Like there's all these forums and like people, people whose proposals get rejected start, you know, saying, well, who's got all the voting power? Who's got the biggest neurons? Democracy is, mm -hmm. it's okay though. Like democracy is messy. Like you can't, you can't get rid of the messiness of democracy and human nature, but you can design uh, digital democracy frameworks that continue functioning, making good decisions, even despite all that messiness. And, and you're going to see a whole cool. bunch of extensions to that coming out too, right? There's going to be intermediation for decentralized governance. There's going to be a whole ecosystem spun up around how to make digital governance smoother or more efficient or you know, totally. moderation or mediation and so on. We, we haven't even scratched the surface on how that works yet, which I think is, I'm excited to see more of that where, wherever it occurs, if it's internet computer or totally. other parts of the Web3 world. Because it's, it, like you said, it's going to be messy. We do not have muscle memory. Messy, um, but you know, there's, there's, it's really like a binary thing. Like, you, you know, you have a choice. The old centralized model, right, where you have a company, you know, board of directors and a CEO, or you know, um, and a bunch of devs who control some kind of service that's running on private servers or you know, big text cloud, the normal model, and you know, somehow it's really a centralized service, it's, but but it just maintains some kind of NFTs on some blockchain, you can have that. Or you can have, you know, what we believe in, which is, you know, as blockchain maximalists, which is, you know, no, there's nothing on uh, centralized tech at all. It's all running on the blockchain. It's built entirely with smart contracts, which even serve the user experience. And because it's enti built entirely on the blockchain, instead of a bunch of devs and insiders and a company or whatever else it is having control over this thing, um, and instead of, and instead of the risk it can be hacked, you just got this kind of beautiful tamper-proof, unstoppable thing on the internet, on, on, on the blockchain, um, and it runs under the control of a, a community DAO, a digital democracy, a digital democracy, which which pushes all the up, updates transparently, and which anybody can acquire governance tokens in and participate in. That's what we believe in, right? And the thing, the reason I think that's what's going to work, is that it's only when you fully decentralize a Web3 service and run it in the mode of a protocol that it becomes like a blockchain itself and you can truly tokenize. Like if you're talking about airdrops to users, it's not so easy these days. Like if you have a centralized um, Web3 service, like what you get in the rest of the ecosystem currently that really has been built in Amazon Web Services where the user experience comes from all the data lives and so on. And there's a bunch of you know, the, the devs at the company that built it put the credit card in, right, to, to pay for the Amazon Web Services. And it just keeps some, like, tokens on Solana or something, right, and some tiny clips of data. Well, you you try giving, like, governance tokens to millions of users. Well, you know, what's going to happen is, especially, you know, going forward, is the regulators are going to come in and say, hey, you're giving away illegal securities to stimulate demand. You're giving them away for free to stimulate demand, Right. You can't do that. The only way that you're able to actually, um, you know, give rise to the power of crowds truly is to really run the whole thing end to end in a decentralized way. That means that the these services have to run on decentralized blockchain, which itself is built from, you know, decentralized hardware and run by independent parties, not just running on Amazon Web Services or else because they can put pressure on the blockchain in that case. And the service itself cannot be centralized. It has to run entirely on the blockchain. All the data has to live there. All the content has to live there. Um, the user experience has to come. You know, the smart contracts have to create the user experience. And that service has to run under the control of a DAO. Like it can't be like there's a CEO and a so on and so forth. And so that means you need a very sophisticated DAO. We call it a service nervous system uh, on the, in, the, in the internet computer ecosystem. And it needs to 
be able to do some pretty complex stuff. Like it needs to be able to manage the updating of the smart contracts that create that service and the configuration and economic policies and stuff like that. Um, and it has to be completely decentralized end to end. And then it's almost like an extension of the blockchain. It is a blockchain, it's a protocol, it's totally autonomous. And now you can have the dream. Now you can say, right, we're putting a proposal in to update this software it, it, such that, you know, active users who refer other users and participate in content moderation or create content that goes, goes viral on the platform, whatever it is in Web3, um, they get given governance tokens. We're going to make the users founders, right? So you're making them owners and part of the team. And now you're building a team of like through the community of millions of people, like developers, the entrepreneurs behind it, the users, everything, um, whose interactions are mediated through this digital democracy. Um, and who really, in a way, are, are, you know, collaborating to make this thing successful from anywhere in the world um, in the same way that people have in the past with blockchains themselves. That, that's the model that's going to work. And that's what Web3 is really, really about. Um, and by the way, last thing, someone uh, on that topic, if, if anyone's interested in seeing how this will work with DeFi, De DeFi on the internet computer works differently because it's a smart contracts or asynchronous and various other things. Um, and there were all these standards that had to be developed, but just, just now things are starting to happen. There's a thing called, there's, there's like a traditional financial exchange with, a, with an order book and everything that's created by a smart contract. And you can find it at I C for internet computer, ic-dex.io. It's like a team of 20 people in, in China that created it. And, um, you know, the user experience of that DEX, which looks like a something more like Poloniex or FDX, right? The user experience is created by smart contract. Um, there's a thing called chain key cryptography. I, I won't try to explain it now, but, you know, the internet computer is also a multi-chain blockchain, so it can create transactions and run smart contracts on other blockchains. Um, and without bridges too. So the, this exchange, this DEX, IC DEX to IO, will, it's just in beta at the moment, but it's going to list most of the crypto assets on earth, right? And, and there's no, there'll be no bridges involved. Like the crypto assets will stay on the um, original blockchains. So you're going to have this like thing that looks like a centralized exchange, but it's completely decentralized that enables people to go from one crypto asset to another arbitrarily with the crypto assets staying on their original blockchains, true multi-chain, no trust, no bridges. And that thing itself will run under the control of a service nervous system DAO, which means that all of the updates to the code go through the DAO. All the updates to the code are not only secure, but transparent. Like there's just no possibility of, you know, like the Sam Bankman Freed being behind the Wizard of Oz behind the curtains that are going, aha, I just got to borrow these assets and invest them in my ecosystem kind of thing. And I would have got away with it too if it wasn't for those pesky kids. Yeah, give bribes to the media and Congress members. I mean, come on. I mean, so so that's the future, right? So, you know, having the ability to run everything on, on, on chain end to end provides simply enormous advantages. So when you're looking at like ICDEX.io, you know, it's worth having a look at. It's in early beta. It's only making a few tokens available at the moment. There's not much volume, but you can see how it works. It's exactly the same as a centralized exchange. Um, and as that develops, they're going to start adding huge numbers of crypto assets, which can be exchanged without them ever leaving their own blockchains. And through this thing called Chanky Crypto that I won't try to explain now, but is a part of how the internet computer works. Um, and that, that exchange will run under the control of a DAO. So everything end to end is decentralized. The user experience is coming from the smart contracts, um, which is why you'll see a weird URL. When you go to icdex.io, it redirects to a weird URL. They haven't hidden it yet. It's just, you're just talking directly to a smart contract. Um, all the updates to that code, all the data, the order book, everything's just a smart contract. And the DAO's controlling the updates, which, and of course, the DAO's built from smart contracts and it's updating, controlling the updating of the other smart contracts. That's for us the future. Like the, the, the advantages are so. Um, overwhelming. Like, why would, you know, sure, we need like centralized exchanges to create fiat to crypto gateways, but the future is very clearly, you know, uh, decentralized exchanges uh, as regards converting one kind of crypto asset to another. So far, we've had like a liquidity pool model, which is very good and very useful for a lot of things. But this thing is like a traditional exchange where you can put in limit orders, market orders. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of demand for that. Um, and, and it's going to run end to end decentralized. Like that's what we believe in as a blockchain maximalists. That's what we believe in. And there aren't any shortcuts. Like you just got to invest a lot of time developing the underlying 
uh, network protocols that make this kind of thing possible. And that's what we've done. So just to answer the question, all this is happening now. People can check it out. Um, and they can see for themselves that like mass market Web3 is already running. That's why the internet computer is the biggest blockchain in the world by transaction volume. Dominic, this has been an incredible, incredible run through everything that is great, not so great, and that needs to happen in the world of Web3 and the decentralized internet and, and what ICP, what the internet computer and what yourselves have been doing over the last few years. Anybody who wasn't au fait with the things that are good and bad about Web3 right now, after having listened to an hour of Dominic, hopefully you should feel more informed. You should feel maybe more curious, maybe a little disappointed. I know from a personal perspective, some of the things you've described today, you know, we come across that on a regular basis. We've, we've been through the years of, you know, blockchain isn't that Bitcoin. We've been through you know, the last 12 months, which has been horrific to watch from the sidelines as market intermediaries or centralized financial institutions have I don't want to say sullied the good name of Web3 because Web3 may not have that good a name already, but I'm, I'm confident that the best way that we win over and create the transformations that the world will benefit from is to do it in code, is to do it in an open and transparent way and to prove it in the applications that we build. And it sounds like yourself, Dominic, the team at Definity, anyone who's building an internet computer is going to be coming up with some stuff that people are going to want to check out and that's going to be an important learning for all of us. We have run long. I, I was expecting to, but we have. I talk too much. I always do this. I always I even lost track. So I apologize to everyone. I just went on a tangent. I lost track. Um, I think I, was, I remember talking about regulators. I was going to say to everyone, what we really need is like regulators. Instead of focusing on what's a security and what's not, like why can't they just like deal with misleading advertising, right? Um, and just yeah. So like you know, if you see a transaction count, like if if some blockchain is publishing a transaction count, it better it better be transactions, not like protocol messages, right? And um, if someone says building on something, then it better be building on something and not on Amazon Web Services. But uh, yeah, so I apologize. I do, I do like to talk and I go contenders, but I hope I hope uh, I, I made some sense. It's been a pleasure listening to you, Dominic. You've got great energy for this. You've got great passion. The vision that you're articulating, I don't think anybody can dispute. I think there's a bunch of questions that we didn't get around to. So what I'm going to try and do is maybe package those questions up. We'll send them over to yourself and the team, and maybe we can come with that up with some sort of, um, you know, post post po podcast update or something like that, where we can come Absolutely. back to some of the questions because there are some really, 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 really interesting ones in the chat. Um, I, I'll, I won't tease them now, but some some about you know privacy implications, technology implications, um, more details, or t t tell us more, tell us more, tell us more. We'll try and get to those after the show. But for now, I'll let you get away to your dinner. Thank you so much for joining us, Dominic, and good Thank luck you. with the rest yeah, of, of the deployment Thanks. and the future of ICP. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.